Welcome to StarCraft 2, ladies and gentlemen, a game I thought I'd never play, but here we are. StarCraft, put simply, is this is us, this is them, and this is how it normally ends up. Now, at last, on this world, vengeance shall be mine. The game's a little bit more complicated than that, so just give me some time to explain it. And before you all ask, no, this is not the campaign, however, I do recommend playing it. It is not the PvP, which surprisingly, 99% of YouTube releases, and I got to do something different to keep it fresh. What we're gonna be covering is probably the less known one, co-op. Co-op is very simple. You and another player load up into the game against AI. Objectives can span from escorting the slowest moving vehicles in existence, despite being in the future, and attacking objectives that are so chunky, it takes so long to kill. Amon has summoned a Void Thresh. It will severely harm the temple for as long as it lives. Conviction is admirable, Commanders. Oh. Once the match is completed, you're rewarded XP. This XP is used as each level up, up to level 15, you earn a new upgrade or unit that basically breaks the game because they're so powerful. Past level 15, you have your mastery upgrades. I'll go more into these, but these are just kind of groundbreaking perks that honestly is kind of disgusting. All right, so now you know what you're playing. Now, the more important question, how to play. Hey, Toxic Spill, isn't that game like super complicated? To which I say, really? It's not that complicated of a game. It looks difficult, but it actually is very easy to understand. Here's a uh, quick example of how to play. It's honestly not that difficult. This here is your headquarters. This is where you're able to train builders that are able to make and repair structures. They are also responsible for harvesting the resources which you can see on screen. Mineral count. This shows how much minerals you have to spend on your units and structures. Over here, you have your vest being gas, which is, to me, as a Canadian, ginger ale. This is used to build advanced buildings and units that specialize for certain cases. Lastly, you have your supply count, which in simple terms, it's just your population account and your maximum available, judging by the two numbers. This can be increased by building supply depots. This is where your builders will harvest minerals and transport them automatically to the HQ. The number on the HQ shows how many builders can work the fields at once. If you have more, it will still harvest the maximum amount. On these locations here, you can build your ginger ale refineries. These are built by the builders that you create at the HQ, and they can have a maximum of three workers on it at once. See, that wasn't too complicated. Basic stuff. It's funny for me to talk about something very basic, which reminds me of the whole point of this video. Rainer. Rainer is one of the free heroes available for the free game. I'm talking $100 with 100% discount free. This video is no way sponsored. I wish it was, but that's beyond the point. So there's no reason not to try him out. His army is equipped with the most necessary equipment to win you the game in such a disgusting manner, it'll make you say to yourself, Good lord, this is so unfair. I honestly feel bad for the AI at this point. I feel like I'm just bullying him. However, Raynor himself is equipped with the greatest equipment in the world to get the job done. A revolver, a glass of whiskey, the accent and the language. It ain't over till it's over, you son of a bitch. All he's missing is the cowboy hat and he'd be an official space cowboy in my books. Versatility. His main ability, it's not written down anywhere, but your buddy Toxic Spill's combat. got you, and trust me, this plays a vital role in how you actually play him. His troops are actually built to accommodate this, so if you're lazy, it's definitely gonna make your job a whole lot easier. He mainly focuses on the use of an expendable wall that moves around. This is known as infantry. It makes up most of his army unless you use mechanical troops, whether it be air or ground troops, and mainly known as a common strategy as spamming. Spamming the same unit, however, it is a high risk high reward move, but when it works, oh boy is it satisfying. He does get support from a wide variety of units if you do accommodate his infantry. This can span from tanks to bikes and battle cruisers to transforming mechs that only get slapped half of the time.
Despite this, he mainly focuses on infantry and making them, and I cannot stress this enough, literally invincible. His calldowns are his main support, which can be found at the top of the screen, which is a very literal term to call down a massive cruiser, making the Titanic look like a paper boat, and gunships that rain terror that screams nom. Pyrian, a battle cruiser of massive proportions and mainly makes a difference between the regular one is the fact that it's on steroids and fires a lot more than the second, basically incinerating anything weak or low health. Opposite to its size, it takes so long to bring out the battle, even with the reduced deployment time. Large targets like army killing hybrids, chunky zerg and protoss units and structures, you're basically just gonna be tickling. There is a fix to this. Much like any problem, if a gun doesn't work, you just make sure to bring a gun bigger gun next time. The Yamato Cannon. This does the job oh too well. Equipped with a tactical jump to move around quickly, defensive drones to back you up, you shouldn't fail. Hopefully. Duskwings. The second call down in probably a play on words, and it does make up for the Hyperion's shortcomings. Massive damage in single targets and structures when all focused on targets. So one, pretty useless. Two, you're working at it. Three, pretty good. Five, real shit. Equipped with one of the meanest upgrades, which is cluster bombs, which is after every missile's fired. Uh, there will be a carpet bomb of explosives right after the missile's contact, so this definitely does help when fighting against a larger number of enemies. However, unlike Raynor himself, they are not perfect, and they are not able to attack other air units. This does make them really bad, and their only defense against ground is their cloaking. Their cloaking, they are heavily reliant on them, mainly because is that if a detector is able to see them, basically, say bye-bye to that call down, you have to wait another, what, two minutes. Yeah. Just to waste your time, just to spite you. I feel like I've been rambling on long enough about space cowboys and thick battle cruisers, and I commend all of you for actually getting this far through the video. Now let's talk about the actual point of playing this hero. Infantry! The expendable manpower late game that can act like a wall that can be easily repaired at a rapid pace. I know it's a terrible thing to say and all, not considering your feelings like, oh yeah, they're people too. Uh, but history has shown us that with a lack of resources, an abundance of manpower will always win. I'm not gonna name that instance, we can probably all put that together ourselves. Rain has access to a wide variety of troops built from the most realistic place you'd probably find infantry in an army. Again, Starcraft's not that complicated. A barracks. Troops come in the form of standard troops, to flamethrower suits, to medics that camp in the back to make sure your casualty count is replaceable at least. Some are good against air. Some are good against infantry. Some are good against armor. So there's something for everyone. Barracks can be upgraded in two different ways. Tech labs allow you to build every single unit, but reactors are able to pump out troops faster than forced conscription. Marines! We, you've seen them. I've lost so many in game that honestly, I don't want to go into that. Marines are your bread and butter. And I mean this figuratively and literally. Marines, when you make a ton of them, they will get you the bread. They will get you that win, but they are as flimsy as butter. They are very strong against air and pretty much average against everything else. They can be upgraded with stim packs that increase their fire rates at the tech lab, as well as riot shields, which gives them a small amount of HP boost, which they definitely do need. Marines are a fantastic unit, don't get me wrong, but they can't survive without medics, or else you're just gonna have to be keep spending a bunch of minerals to be able to actually afford them. They can't attack, but their healing is absolutely insane. Plus, you're able to upgrade their heal rate in the tech lab. They're not- that's not terrible. They also have an extended range so they can actually sit in the back in front of all the troops and actually do all the healing. They are the backbone of your army considering they can also even heal mechanical units. A little broken, I'm gonna be honest. On the thicker side of things, units also known as Marauders and Firebats. Normally I'd feel off grouping these two together and all, but they have the same suit and they have different purposes and weapons that are actually able to do this thing that the Marines fall short a little bit. It's called damage. Marauders. The dark ones colored in black and are able to tear apart anything that has heavy armor or is built out of metal. They're not able to attack air forces and against light units, they're basically trash. They're able to use stim packs like the marines, which do make up for it in a sense. Their shots at the tech lab can be made into slowing down enemies. Very cheap upgrade, very very essential. I honestly don't know why they would normally not come with this as a default, 
Because I'm pretty sure if someone got hit on the body anywhere, really, with an RPG, it would slow them down if not kill. Fire bats, the thicker of the two, and for good reason. They throw plasma. Not like a baseball or anything, but it's super heated. So much though that it is said to cook enemies inside their own skin. Wait a minute. I wrote that? Uh, cook enemies inside their own skin. Well, okay then, I guess I, I guess that is true. They have to get close to the enemy to do damage, as you would already imagine. They're a flamethrower. There is an upgrade that allows them to save their lives, in probably the most unorthodox way. Stepping back a few steps. Yeah. Stepping back a few steps can literally save their lives. Because this puts a further distance away from the enemy and them, allowing them to burn them more often. Far back to what Marauder misses is the ability to cook entire armies of infantry medium rare. Further enhanced by the radius of plus 40%. I know it sounds technical, but it's 40% bigger flame, which means any enemy within that is going to take damage. This changes the area probably most comparable to a spray can to a fire hose. To top it off, fire bats are probably the thickest of all of the troops. They have the most health pool, which makes sense for their close range. This can be further enhanced, and this upgrade applies to all troops. This is a groundbreaking upgrade that is exclusive to Raynor. Vanadium plating is unlocked at level 10, and it becomes a mandatory upgrade for Raynor, considering the fact that he primarily uses infantry on the battlefield against enemies that can theoretically and practically annihilate you in a second. Every upgrade done at the required building allows the health of those units responsible have an increase in health, the engineering bay for the infantry and the armory for the vehicles. The game even knows that this is such an important upgrade that he has an entire mastery perk completely dedicated to this upgrade. Which if you thought that everything I've already said is broken, you know nothing yet. In summary, now you know what you're mainly going to use, mainly these flesh bags called infantry to soak up the damage that can be easily replaced on the fly, out of all the enemies you face from the daunting hybrid that can curve stomp you into oblivion. You have just entered the other side of the Space Cowboys kit. Heavy support on land and air. Some of these vehicles are specialized for certain jobs, therefore I won't go into exactly how you use them. Even with my dumbass and my inability to use the hotkeys, I still know how to use them. From the air, Raynor uses an arsenal that would put the American military to shame due to the unnecessary amount of firepower they can bring. They can be made at the starport and that health upgrade does apply. Striking for both air and land are Vikings. These are highly adaptable. You've seen them at the beginning of the video except they don't get slapped that hard all the time. They can be made in a pair of two from the reactor attachment, and they are able to transform from a mech to a jet. They are able to destroy anything on the ground in air with ease. Just watch for their small health pools, because they are pretty fragile. Vikings are not the only ones that are able to wreak havoc on the ground, which is why you have Banshees. I don't see them being used a lot, mainly for the fact that they are a worse version of the Duskwings, which you already know, and they can only attack ground. The Vikings, they can transform between attacking Aaron as a jet, or a walker and uh, attack the ground. Uh, trust me, though, Banshees are powerful, but they're very limited because their survivability is highly dependent on their cloaking, which they can run out of, and if a detector sees them, they have less health than Duskwings, so they're going to go down easier. Remember earlier in the video when I said spamming was a strategy? Well, this is the reason why. Battle cruisers cost a fortune to make, but they can be and they can be brought down pretty much instantly. Surprisingly for their size, they actually don't have a lot of health. Keep something on the front lines, mainly infantry, because you're able to replace them, and then you have medics to keep them alive. They're able to light up their ground with scorching rounds at such a fast rate, which can be upgraded, although I really don't recommend it, though it can turn real south real quick. Believe me, there's nothing worse than losing even one of these. It's like a punch to the gut. It hurts. Now you know what can support you from the air. Now, the ground. The ground, in Raynor's case, is more used as a defensive method more than anything. They can still support infantry on the ground, but I would not recommend it. Siege tanks. Siege tanks are probably one of the coolest units in StarCraft, but they're more used for the siege part more than the tank part. This takes the form of the artillery cannon. 
as you saw in the intro, the tanks unfold and they turn to artillery cannons that fire superheated tungsten. This does massive splash damage, it's honestly disgusting. Constructed in a factory, they are able to build up a defense, in most cases, make them unbreakable. Combined with bunkers in the front and inventories inside, with the tanks in the back, any enemy that walks in front is going to die. Vulture bikes are an okay unit. I know it's like out of place and everything to say, oh yeah, you know, this is good, this is good, this is good, but the vulture bikes, they're okay. They have super low health and they do a small amount of damage. They have two uses, which is to lay mines, which is probably their most useful quality. This is the defensive part. And the fact is they're fast. Problem is, is that their hitbox is really bad. Hopefully with all this knowledge, you'll be able to grab the win at the end of the game. You'll be rewarded XP, which you need to use at level 15, and after that to get the mastery points. This will make your experience much easier if you're having a tough time. My personal opinion is to max out one in each section because I see no point in upgrading something that's already terrible. Instead, I like to double down on the strengths. First one is the research resource cost, which is an easy one to pick up. Since you're mainly going to be using infantry, or in some cases you're going to be using armor, I figured that they're getting the upgrades as quickly as possible would be the best move. The second one, and this one is highly dependent on how you play, normally I would go for the Hyperion due to its long cooldown, but I do change once in a while to Banshees whenever I need to dominate the ground. I am telling you, this last section, you will need to go with Medic Heal Additional Target all the way. Reducing the number of medics you require to heal your army and keep your allies alive. This is like an insanely important upgrade because that means you require less medics to keep your army. One last thing before I end the video, I have something to note. This video has been a labor of love for me, meaning I will get zero payment and most likely zero praise from it, but I'm doing it anyway. This is completely different editing style of what I've already done in the past and requires me to work a lot harder just to get the clips even in the background and don't even get me started about writing this script for the video. I want to make this a series that teaches people how to play and navigate co-op in StarCraft 2 so I will be doing videos on the rest of the commanders stay tuned for that. Next time we're going to be talking about the edgiest woman in the world. With all that being said ladies and gentlemen I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.